So the question is therefore, how to model this fluids. Um, now, there are two answers to that one is a very uh, sort of atomistic or molecular description. So, you can say that well if I talk of water for example, it consists of so this fluids if I look deep inside consists of water molecules uh, H2O and uh, I could sort of simulate each of these individual water molecules in a sort of molecular dynamic simulation and then try to see how this water molecules affects the dynamics of whatever else that is present in this medium. So, for example, this is a protein that is present in this water. You can do an explicit uh, simulation. Um, so, this is a lysozyme protein in explicit water. You can do these molecular dynamic simulations to see exactly how the solvent is going to affect this uh, the states or the conformations of this protein. That is a very detailed answer. It has certain advantages in that you are taking into account explicitly all the forces that these individual water molecules are going to exert on each other and on whatever protein or organism of interest. On the other hand, these simulations are very um, resource intensive. If you do molecular dynamic simulations, you cannot go, you cannot continue the simulations for a very long time. So, we are restricted to sort of observing events which take place over a very short time scale. So, the molecular description has its advantages and its disadvantages. Um, what we will do is we will not focus on this molecular description, but what we will do is we will focus on a continuum description. And like I said, in this continuum description, what we will do is that we will parameterize the, uh, the fluid by these two quantities a local density field, uh, which says how dense, uh, how many molecules of that fluid are there, and a local velocity field, uh, which says how fast the fluid is moving. So, the local density field is a scalar, uh, the local velocity field is a vector. So, you have a scalar field and a vector field and we will use these two to sort of develop our equations of motion. And eventually what we will come up with is this Navier-Stokes equation. So, before I go into the derivation, um, uh, this is the form of the Navier-Stokes equation. Over here are the sort of uh, material derivative on the left hand side this uh, these are the on the right hand side of the forces on a on this fluid. So, there is a force due to pressure gradients, there is a force due to viscosity and this eta sort of is what is called the kinematic viscosity. It has the viscosity and the density together. Okay. So, that is what we will try to do ok. So, before we start the derivation uh, let us just clearly define what we mean when I say viscosity. So, the canonical way of defining is that you assume you have let us say two parallel plates like this and in between you have your fluid ok. Let us say you pull one of these plates with some amount of force let us call it f and as you pull it sort of exerts a shear force on this fluid and in response it starts moving with a velocity. And if you do experiments, what you will find, and let us say that these plates have some area A, this is the area. And if you do experiments, what you will find is that for many liquids, not all, provided your forces are low and so on, uh, you will see that this force is, let us say, this force is going to pro be proportional to the velocity with which this plate moves. And if you write out all the constants what it turns out is that the force per unit area which is the stress is going to be equal to the velocity divided by the distance between the plates. So, this is let us say d and the constant of proportionality is what I call as my viscosity ok. So, this is my viscosity. We assume many things. We assume, for example, there is a no slip boundary condition, which means that at the top layer of contact of the fluid with the plate, there is zero relative velocity, which means that the top layer of the fluid moves with the plate, ok. It is mostly true, or rather, it is the most common boundary condition to take, 
there are cases where it's uh, not valid for example, in inviscid flows such as superfluid helium and so on. Any fluid which obeys this equation that the force is going to be proportional to the velocity and this constant of proportionality appears in this way which is called the viscosity. This is what is called a Newtonian fluid, this is called a Newtonian fluid. There is a whole class of fluids which are non Newtonian fluids, which are non Newtonian fluids. But provided your uh, forces are small or your velocities are small, uh, most fluids to a first approximation you can start off treating as a Newtonian fluid and see what uh, what that gives you. Um, There are some obvious non Newtonian fluids such as paint and so on. Um, biological media is also non Newtonian, but depending on the question that you are asking, you can to a certain approximation treat it as Newtonian fluids. So, generally, whenever you have, let us say, a pure fluid such as water and you mix in stuff in it, such as proteins or whatever, um, any additives in that sense, you, uh, you sort of disrupt the pure Newtonian character. It will become non Newtonian to a certain extent in that this relation will not be generally valid. However, to a first approximation we will deal with it deal with biological fluids as Newtonian fluids and then if it turns out that it that does not match what you are seeing we will try to relax our approximations and see what a non Newtonian fluid would do yes. You want to see the non Newtonianness of a biological uh, fluid. You can do stress strain relationships uh, in a microscope. You extract the sort of uh, cell fluid and you can do stress strain uh, experiments on that and plot how the stress goes as a function of strain and see whether it is linear. But perhaps you are asking in a more organic context um, offhand, I do not. I will see if I can think of something which in in a in vivo sort of a system shows the non Newtonianness of these fluids. All right. Uh, so, what we will do is that we will stick to Newtonian fluids for the time being, which is that we will assume. So, this definition by it, this equation by itself defines for me what a Newtonian fluid is. Any fluid which obeys this sort of a relation, the velocity is proportional to the force, so the force is proportional to the velocity with this constant of proportionality is what I will call a Newtonian fluid ok. Um, and in fact, in a in a setup like this uh, you have one where you have one plate fixed and you have the upper plate moving the bottom plate fixed. You can actually solve for this full velocity profile um, let us say this is my x direction, this is my y direction. You can see you can show that the velocity profile will increase linearly. So, at the bottom plate th this is stationary. So, the velocity is 0 at the top plate the velocity is v and in between you can write this uh, v as a function of y. So, this is my y axis and it is flowing let us say in the x direction because that is my shear direction. Uh, you can sh show that this is going to be a simple linear sort of relationship. So, when y is equal to 0 at this bottom plate it is not going to move when y is equal to v at uh, sorry when y is equal to d at the top plate it is going to move with the velocity. So, if you think about this if you think about this fluid is composed of sort of layers ok, where each layer is also sort of sliding past one another. You can also write this as f by a is equal to some eta del v by del y. So, each as each layer of fluid sort of slides past the other there is an associated friction caused by the sliding and the rate of change of velocity as you move from one layer to the next will be proportional to the force and again with this constant of proportionality given by the viscosity. You can write down what is the dimensions of this viscosity write down what is the dimensions of this viscosity. So, eta 
is force per unit area. So, this is let us say Newton per meter square and into the distance divided by the velocity meter per second. So, this is Newton second per meter square which is basically Pascal seconds. Newton per meter square is Pascals and then seconds. So, that is what I call the standard unit of viscosity and the viscosity of water is like I said the viscosity of water is around 10 to the power of minus 3 Pascal seconds ok. I you can write down other things uh, for example, if you were to look at the viscosity of air that is roughly of the order of 10 to the power of minus 5 Pascal seconds. Well, the syrup this uh, corn syrup or glycerin would be of the order of syrup would be something around 1 to 10 in that range Pascal seconds ok. And pitch as I wrote down is even much more viscous ok. So, so for the time being the what we will assume what we will interest ourselves in is so, the viscosities which, which lie in this range of water, so around 10 to the power of my minus 3 Pascal seconds, but like I said it is not just the viscosity which will determine your flow properties, it is together with the velocity as well as the length scales that you are looking at. So, for example, uh, for us as human beings water is not such a viscous object, it is more viscous than air yes, but it is still not something that we would think of as very difficult to sort of swim through. Whereas, if you are talking about a microorganism which is on the scale of microns, the same environment water is going to look at uh, it is going to seem to this microorganism as if it is swimming through pitch ok. And that is where this Reynolds number is going to come ok. Um, so, with this definition of the viscosity let us try to then write down this equation this Navier-Stokes equation. So, the Navier Stokes that it is uh, is nothing but uh, Newton's second law, it is Newton's second law. So, that is good, we all know Newton's second law, it is just Newton's second law applied specifically for the case of fluids. Uh, so, you can derive it in a lot of ways. So, what I will do is a very loose, uh, almost hand waving derivation just to give you a sense of where these terms come from. Um, if you are interested I uh, will show a couple of books at the end uh, let me show it now. For example, this is a nice book uh, ah, this third book is a nice book uh, for if you are interested more deeper in the mathematics or formal description of this uh, physical hydrodynamics ok. Uh, the second book uh, Nelson has a very nice um, sort of intuitive uh, explanations of different phenomenon uh, for in viscous highly viscous fluids or in less viscous fluids and so on. So, that is a more intuitive description uh, this third book is a more mathematical description ok. All right. So, this is what we will try to do we will apply Newton's second law to fluids and see what that gives us. So, what we will write is force is equal to mass times acceleration, but for a parcel of so let us say I have some fluid ok. In this fluid I select a small parcel and I will calculate all the forces and this accelerations for this small parcel of fluid. Um, what do I mean when I say it is small? Um, it is small in the sense that it is smaller than the scales, it is smaller than scales at which the velocity changes appreciably, at which the velocity changes appreciably right. So, for example, if you have a velocity variation which looks like this I do not know you take a small enough segment such that in this segment you can say that the velocity is something constant ok. So, whatever is the scale of variation of velocity for this fluid that you are looking at 
to choose a of choose a small box of fluid a small parcel such that within that box you can assign a velocity to that parcel. So, you can assign a velocity however, you cannot make it too small because remember we are doing a continuum description. So, we do not want to go so small that you have only a few molecules in there because that is the description of molecular dynamics. So, you have to have a macroscopic number of fluid molecules. However, it must be small enough that it is smaller than the scales at which the velocity changes. So, I take such a fluid element and let us say that this fluid element is at some position x y z ok at some time t some time t. Let us take a simple 1 d case like I said I will do it I will make as many simplifications as I can. So, let us take a simple 1 d case. So, I say that this velocity which in general is a function of this r and t I will say that this is simply a function of x and t and is directed in the x direction ok. So, the fluid if this is my x direction it just moves like this ok. Um, so, I have this fluid uh, parcel which was at x y z at time t after some time delta t it is moved to x plus delta x after some time delta t it is moved to x plus delta x ok at time t plus delta t ok. So, what I want to write down is this velocity at this new position x plus delta x at time t plus delta t ok and I do that by doing a Taylor series expansion around this v x t. So, this is v x t plus delta x del v del x plus delta t del v del t. I will just write terms up to first order. So, the velocity after at this new position after a time interval delta t I write as a Taylor series expansion. This delta x is the distance it has moved in this time delta t right. What is this distance delta x therefore, it is this velocity with which it was moving <coughs> times delta t right. That is the distance it has moved del v del x plus delta t del v del t right and here is v of x comma. Therefore, the change in velocity delta v which is this subject minus this v x t is therefore, del v del t plus v times del v del x with an overall delta t outside right. I take this delta t and this delta t common. So, I have a del v del t plus v times del v del x. And if I divide this delta v by delta t in the limit the delta t is very small that is nothing but my acceleration right. So, my acceleration I can write down my acceleration as del v del t plus v times del v del x ok. So, this captures the explicit time dependence this captures the explicit time dependence of the velocity. This captures the this captures the change due to the parcel moving itself due to the parcel itself moving ok. So, this is the spatial dependence this is the convex this is called the convective term this is called the convective term. So, this parcel itself has moved to a new position ok and the change due to this new position is captured in this convective term the explicit time dependent change is captured in this del v del t term ok. So, the total change the rate of the total rate of change of this velocity which is the acceleration has this term plus this convective term the del v del t plus v del v del x ok. If you were to generalize this uh, so, I took this for the simple case of a velocity which looks like this. If you were to generalize this uh, to any 
any v r t any general v r t then what you can show is that what you will get is this explicit time dependence term, but then something like ok. Actually, this And this if you write in vector notation is nothing but del v del t del v del t plus v dot del operating on the velocity itself. Okay. So, the first term captures the explicit time dependence of the velocity, this captures the change due to the fact that this fluid parcel is changing its position as it moves in time okay. all right. So, that is my acceleration. So, the total time derivative uh, let me write it somewhere um, So, the total time derivative which is often written with this capital T is this operator del del t plus v plus v dot del. So, if you operate it on the velocity del v this d v d t is del v del t plus v dot del operating t. So, this is my acceleration term ok. So, I have this fluid element the acceleration in in terms of this velocity vector I can write down the acceleration term in this fashion. So, this is called this is also called the material time derivative this is called the material time ok. That is one side of the Newton's laws ok. So, once I have the acceleration I, I can put it over here um now, what I need to do is I need to write down the forces that are acting on this fluid element all right. So, forces forces I can write it, it could be of two types it could be external external or body forces which act on the fluid as a whole for example, uh, gravity ok. So, for example, gravity or it could be internal or internal which arise due to interactions with other fluid elements. So, in this internal forces you could write a pressure force which arise due to pressure gradients across the fluid or you could and you could write a viscous force which arises due to viscous friction between these different layers of the fluid ok. So, this these two forces are what I will try to write down the pressure force and the viscous force. Once I have written down expressions for these forces, I will put them together with this acceleration term and I will write down f equal to m e ok. okay. So, let me first do this pressure force. And again I will do it as a in the simplest of cases. So, let me draw a cube. Okay. So, the here is my fluid element that I have taken. Let us say it has dimensions delta x, delta y, delta z. So, this is the same fluid parcel for which I calculated the acceleration. Now, I will calculate the force on this. Uh, let me draw my axis. Let us say this is x, this is y, and this is z. So, the pressure force will arise due to pressure variations in the fluid and will act inward and normal to these faces. So, for example, like this and then like this on that back face like this and this and so on for the top and the bottom. 
So, each of these each of the six faces of this cuboid that I have taken of sides delta x delta y delta z will face a pressure force ok. So, this will be let us say this will be on this face it will be p of x on this face will be p of x plus delta x uh, and this is my y. So, this will be p of y this is p of y plus delta y and similarly p of z p of z plus delta ok. So, each face will experience some sort of a pressure that will give rise to a net force on this on this fluid parcel. So, let us first con uh, let us consider this faces uh, let us say that lie along the y z plane ok. So, that back face and this front face all right. So, this face over here and this back face over there. Note that the pressure force sort of acts inward. So, these two forces these the, the vector on associated with these two forces act in the opposite direction. So, I can write the total pressure force along this x axis uh, which will be a combination of the forces on these two faces. So, the pressure force along the x axis will be because of this face over here. Uh, which is p of x times the area which is delta y delta z plus the force due to this on this face which is going to be minus of p x plus delta x delta y delta z ok. Pressure is force per unit area. So, force is pressure into area the area of, the, of each of this is delta y delta z the pressure on that is p of x the pressure on this front face is minus p of x plus delta x. So, what is this? This is nothing but minus of del p del x right which is p x minus p x plus delta x divided by delta x. So, which means if I multiply and divide by delta x what I get is this right. So, minus del p del x into delta x delta y delta z that is a lot of the force along this x axis. I can do the same thing for this force along the y axis and and the force along the z axis right. So, I can write the force along the y axis which will be a sum of this p y and the this p y plus I have written y plus delta z sorry y plus delta y on this face ok. And again they are going to be opposite. So, again this will be minus del p del y and the area of these faces are delta x delta z and you will get a delta y because of this derivative. So, this will come out to be again delta x delta y delta z right. And similarly, in the z direction it will be minus del p del z minus del p del z ok. Right. So, if I write it in vector form. So, the pressure force then is what is minus gradient of p right which is which has these components del p del x along x axis del p del y along y axis del p del z into delta x delta y delta z. So, that is the force due to this pressure pressure variations across the fluid. So, let me also write that. So, delta F p is minus gradient of the pressure gradient of the pressure into this volume of this fluid parcel delta x delta y delta z. So, that is the pressure force and now this last part is this viscous force. Viscous And remember viscous forces arise because of this viscous friction. So, as you have layers of fluid which are flowing past one another you have one layer like this one layer like that right. They will exert a friction on each other they will exert a friction related uh, one will exert a frictional force on the other and that will give rise to this viscous force. If they are moving with different flow velocities then this gradient in the velocity will give rise 
to this viscous force ok. All right, let me again draw where did I rub out that anyway let me again draw that fluid parcel ok. Let us say ok, let me continue this. let us say that is my x axis. So, let us say that is my x axis, this is my y axis and that is my z axis ok. And remember that the sides are delta x, delta y and delta z. So, that is the cube that I have chosen ok. So, instead of deriving the full form is a little complicated. So, again I will take a I uh, will use a simple argument which is to say that I will say that let me assume that the velocity field is of this form ok. The velocity field only has a component along the z direction there are no x and y components. So, it only has a component on the along the z direction and that component depends only on the x position ok. What does that mean? It means that if I were to plot the velocity field it will only have components along this z direction right and the height of this which is the module which is the magnitude of this will depend on the position along the x axis. So, let us say I take something like this as you move along the x axis the component gets larger and larger ok. So, it is smallest here larger 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 you are moving along the x axis it gets larger. So, it is a very cooked up sort of scenario. but still it makes life a little easy and one gets to the same equation ok. So, I take a I take a velocity field like this ok. So, and I will try to calculate the viscous forces uh, remember the viscous forces will arise due to derivative to the rate derivatives of this change in the velocity right del v uh, rubbed it out. How does the velocity change as you go from one layer to another which means that the only derivative that will survive is this delta v delta x right because I have taken these other components to be 0 which means that it will only be non 0 for faces along this y z plane. It will only be non 0 for this face and for that. So, it will only be non 0 for this face over here and this back face over there. So, if I take this face uh, let us say this is my x and this is my x plus delta x. So, if I take this face at x ok and I can write down the force well, let me write down the force see this is the viscous force on the face at x ok. So, on this face over here what is that going to be proportional to that is going to be proportional to this gradient of the velocity which means del v z del x right. There will be a constant of proportionality remember eta. So, eta times the gradient that was the force per unit area. So, therefore, the force will be this into the area which is delta y delta z right. This is along the z axis. Similarly, you can write down the force on the face at x plus delta x this front face. So, this is the same at x plus delta x that will again have this viscosity it will have a del v z at x plus delta x del x right and the area of the face is the same because I have taken a cube. So, it is that height ok. 
there is going to be a relative minus sign for one of these. So, this inside is greater. So, if I have taken a velocity field like this at this phase at this back phase the velocity just outside is smaller than the velocity just inside right. Which means that this frictional force is going to try to bring down the velocity because it is a frictional force. Similarly, for this front face the velocity just inside is smaller than the velocity just outside which means it is going to try to increase the velocity. So, there will be a this one will have a minus sign this one will have a plus sign. So, the total force therefore, the net force I can then write as over here delta F z ok. This is uh, let me write z here this is the viscous force is going to be the sum of these two. So, minus eta del V z del x at x plus del V z at x plus delta x del x times delta y delta z ok. What is this? So, if I this uh, no the minus sign is not overall this is minus that is plus ok. Which means that if I multiply and divide by delta x what I get is a eta del the second derivative del 2 v z del x 2 right times now delta x delta y delta z. Okay. So, this viscous force then I have taken this very simple form, but what it tells me is that this viscous force is proportional to the viscosity which is fine. There is a second derivative of the velocity, there is a second derivative of the velocity into the volume of this torso into the volume of this torso ok. This is for the simple case I can now try to generalize it to any arbitrary case and you can show that. So, the general derivative is of course, del right and I have my velocity which is v. So, if I need to take the second derivative of the velocity it means that I need to have two del operators which will act on this velocity field right. And you can show in this elementary vector calculus that the only two linearly independent combinations of two dels and a v are one is this Laplacian of v ok and the second one is gradient of the diver gradient of the divergence of v ok. These are the only two linearly independent combinations that you can have of two del operators and a v. Okay. So, if you generalize this expression that we derive for this very simple velocity field it will be in general a combination of a term that looks like this and a term that looks like that right. Now, what sort of a fluid will not have this term anyone incompressible fluid right. So, if your fluid is incompressible then an incompressibility condition means that the divergence of V is 0. So, if you talk of an incompressible fluid then the only term that will survive is this vector Laplacian of the velocity field which means that this viscous force which means that this viscous force F v will be the viscosity the Laplacian of the velocity field times delta x delta y delta z for an incompressible fluid for an incompressible Okay. For compressible fluids, you'll have a correction term, which will have something which is proportional to this. Since everything is on this parcel, let me write the delta. Okay. 
all right. So, I have everything together now I have the acceleration term I have this pressure force I have this viscous force and whatever external body force that I might have ok. So, I can put all of this together in this f equal to m a and see therefore, what I get. So, what I want to write is f equal to m a for this parcel of fluid right. Remember this parcel that I have taken is this cuboid very nice cuboid of delta x delta y delta z ok. So, therefore, what is the mass of this parcel that is the density of the fluid times the volume delta x delta y delta z right. The acceleration I have found out is this right. So, the acceleration is del v del t plus v dot del operating on v that is m a and the forces are this plus this ok. So, if I write everything together note that when I do m into a I have this volume of this parcel coming in this volume appears in all the terms it appears in the m a term it appears in the viscous force it appears in the pressure force therefore, that will cancel out right as it should you should not get a different equation depending on whether you have taken a smaller parcel or a larger parcel right. So, all this delta x delta y delta z will drop out. So, what I will get for this on this m a side is rho times del v del t plus rho times v dot del v right that is my m a and then on this side I will get a minus gradient of p plus plus the viscosity times the Laplacian of v right. So, that is my force equal to mass into acceleration for a fluid parcel of this of some arbitrary volume. Now, generally you just take this row to the other side. So, you write del v del t plus v dot del v is equal to minus 1 by rho gradient of the pressure plus eta by rho Laplacian of v and this eta by rho which is the ratio of the viscosity to the density of the fluid is often written as nu which is called the kinematic viscosity. So, nu is equal to the viscosity divided by the density and it is called the kinematic viscosity. Okay. So, and what we have this equation over here plus of course, if you have any external body force you write that as well. So, if you were to have for example, gravity you would write rho into delta x delta y delta z into g right m g. So, this delta x delta y would cancel you would get rho g over here. So, whatever you get you write some f external depending on whatever external body force you have. So, this equation is the famous Navier Stokes equation. I did a very loose derivation um, like I said, but there are more formal ways to derive it in all its full glory in without assuming the skewboid and so on and so forth. You can do it for an arbitrary fluid parcel and you will come to the same equation the Navier Stokes equation ok. So, this is my Navier Stokes. This is well, let me be more correct. This is for an incompressible Navier Stokes. This is for an incompressible. This is what the canonical Navier Stokes is, but of course, if you have a compressible fluid, then you will have this additional term which will be a gradient of divergence of V over there, something like that. All right.